Turn to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to continue our study in Galatians. We started a couple of Sundays ago. Hope everybody's feeling extra refreshed with a little extra hour of rest. It's good to be together. Context of this letter is that, um, just to kind of summarize, first two chapters, there was a dispute over the role of the law of Moses for Christians, specifically Gentile Christians, people who were being converted from pagan backgrounds, who are now going to enjoy the blessings of being in Christ. This raised a, a question for all the people who had formerly been, who had grown up as Jews, as law-abiding, God-fearing um, Jews. How do they fit into the picture? Paul had gone, as we know, uh, throughout the Roman Empire, preaching the gospel, telling people about Jesus, establishing churches in many places. The people that would hear and believe, they were baptized, and they started worshiping together, and they, they formed congregations. And then, following behind him, and especially in this letter, it's written to the churches in the region of Galatia, which there were several, some brethren came, or some false brethren, not people came, from originating from Jerusalem in that area. They made their way around and kind of came along behind Paul. And they told the people, well, you've never been circumcised. You've never obeyed the law. You need to start keeping the law, beginning with being circumcised. Because what they understood was from their history in the past, if there were people who were not Jews who wanted to enjoy the blessings of being part of God's people, they had to be converted. They had to become like, like the rest of everybody else. And there was a, there was a process for that, to be, become a Jew. And that would require being circumcised if you had never been circumcised and, and, and start keeping the law. And then you were welcome into the family and you could start enjoying the blessings of being part of God's people. Well, from their point of view, these churches gathering on the first day of the week, worshiping, claiming to be saved, and claiming to be Christians had skipped a whole step, and they had, they had missed a very important fundamental thing that they had, they had, uh, Paul had not taught them correctly. And so they challenged Paul's authority. And you can tell by the, Paul's defense that they basically had relegated him to some sort of second-class apostle. Um, maybe he had got his message, but he, from, he got it from somebody else, and he doesn't quite have it all right. He's not telling you everything you need to know. They had challenged Paul's authority, and they basically built their authority on the fact that they had come from Jerusalem, where the original apostles were, so you really need to listen to what we say because we know what we're talking about, and that Paul, he was kind of not right about some things. That You can tell that's what they were saying by Paul's defense of himself. So he immediately launches into this defense in the first two chapters. First of all, he emphasizes his independence as an apostle, the fact that he was called by the Lord, not secondhand, not he didn't get his through word of mouth through somebody else, but the Lord not only called him and spoke to him, but also revealed the gospel to him. And he didn't go sit at the apostle training school in Jerusalem to learn how to be an apostle. He actually had been taught by the Lord directly. And then in chapter 2, we see that not only was he independent in his, uh, the source of what he was teaching, but he had actually stood up to some of those that everybody looked up to as being the leaders, specifically Peter. When, when this particular issue came up, which is the role of Gentiles in the church, formerly Gentiles, let's say, and, and Peter began to make a distinction between himself and the people of a Jewish background, and the pagan background people who are now all supposed to be one, but Peter participated in this uh, partitioning of the group there by kind of withdrawing and staying. So now you start to see two little groups forming. Paul had confronted Peter publicly over that. Of course, the reason he's telling this to the Galatians is not just to you know, run Peter down or drag him through the mud, but it is to show that Paul, number one, he got his authority directly from the Lord. And number two, when it came into conflict, even with some of those who seemed influential, he had stood firm on this and insisted that this was right and had rebuked Peter to his face in front of everybody else. 
when Peter was out of step in this particular, um, on this particular issue. So he's establishing the strength of his um, authority as an apostle, I think, is what's happening in chapters 1 and 2. So having defended himself sort of personally, he starts in chapter 3 to, to go into the biblical explanation of why the Gentiles did not need to first become Jews in order to enjoy the blessings of being part of God's people. So he started out by defending his authority as an apostle, and now he's going to go through and explain to them from the scriptures why the gospel does not require things like being circumcised in order to be part of God's people. Because that's what they apparently that was the that was the assumption. If you want to be part of if you want to be part of the um, people of God and, and inherit the blessings of being God's people, well, there's a process, and that process starts with circumcision. And Paul is going to argue here, no, it doesn't, and let me show you why. And so that's really what we're going to see here is we just we're going to just walk through chapter three and see if we can understand his argumentation. Now, you might think on the front end, well, this has nothing to do with us, but it actually has everything to do with us in some ways, because even though we don't struggle with the question of, well, if you meet somebody and teach them the gospel, nobody would ever dream of saying that person needs to be circumcised before they can be uh, become a Christian. So with that particular aspect of this, we don't wrestle with. But the notion of how are we saved? What is the basis of our salvation is very relevant. And I think that people have a tendency, we, we drift in the direction of the type of mentality that says it's a long list of rules and we have to keep all these rules and it's this law-based thing. And Paul's going to argue, no, that's not the way that it works. And so really to see that in its entirety, we need to get all the way through chapter five. And so we'll see this argument kind of develop over the next few lessons. But today we'll just start here in chapter 3, and that'll be our lesson. So let's just start in verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Already an interesting verse. That word bewitched sounds funny in a biblical context, doesn't it? Uh, actually, it could mean literally to cast a spell, but it also could be used metaphorically, which is probably what he means here. He's not saying they had literally been you know, somebody had worked some spell on them. But that's the idea. Like, how did you get, how did you fall under the spell of these false teachers? How did this happen? And his response to that is, Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Well, what, how does that respond to the, the bewitching idea? Well, it's like if, if you've seen the cross, if you've seen Jesus died for you, that's what you responded to. You know, he says in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. So the message of the cross, the message of preaching Jesus crucified is the drawing power. And they had responded to that. So what could possibly come along later and have a, have a different effect on them? How could somebody come along? with What kind of message did they bring that was more powerful than Jesus on the cross, which is what they had originally responded to? And that's what he's saying. I'm, I'm, I'm perplexed by you. I don't understand who had this influence. How did they bewitch you? How did they, how did they get you off track onto some other gospel, as we saw in chapter 1, when you've seen... And I, I love that depiction of preaching. Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 2 that I decided to deter, I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That the preaching of the gospel is at its core the preaching of Jesus crucified, the Lamb of God. And that the job of preaching is to publicly portray that. We did that last week together as we went through the uh, account of the crucifixion in Luke. And we sang that together. We all told the story together through song. We read it together. And we saw Jesus Christ portrayed as crucified very publicly as we saw that in our hearts and minds as we tell that story. And that's the drawing power of the gospel. Really, it's right. Jesus said, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And he said that referring to the way that he would die. So that is the thing that we respond to. That's what connects us as family is our faith in that sacrifice in Jesus as the son of God who died for us and rose on the third day. Now let's continue. Verse two, let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Have you having begun by the spirit? 
Are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? To see who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, do so by works of the law or by the hearing with faith. Paul's going to apply a logical argument here, two different ways, using a timeline. So first he uses the timeline of their own experience. And he says, let me just ask you this, like reason with me here. Think through this. Let's think about this together. When you were saved and you received the Holy Spirit, and they, had, they lived in the time when that included miraculous gifts, they had experienced those things. He said, when all of that happened, did that happen because you had started keeping the law of Moses? Or did that happen because you had responded by faith to the message of the cross? Now, it's a rhetorical question, but they knew the answer. They had been saved. They had received the Holy Spirit. They had experienced miraculous gifts as, as a, after the fact that they had heard the message of the Jesus on the cross and believed it. And when they responded by faith to that, they had received the Spirit. So he says, so how is somebody going to come along now and say, oh, yeah, and by the way, you can't be saved unless you keep the law. It's like, just think about it. You experienced this yourselves. That wasn't a result of keeping the law. That was a result of your faith in Jesus. And now, having begun by the Spirit, you're going to somehow be completed by this in this fleshly act, in this keeping of the, a fleshly kind of commandment. And then he, basically, he begins to introduce his argument in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So hold your place there and just flip back over so we keep this straight in our mind. Genesis 15. There's several key events in the life of Abraham and the timing of those. Again, now we talk about a different timeline. So there was a timeline of their personal experience, which was what was the sequence of events that happened? And it was that you heard the cross, you believed, you received the spirit. So there's that timeline that precludes the imposition of the law. Then he says, now he's going to introduce a different timeline. And it starts with Abraham all the way back in Genesis 12, really, but we're going to go to 15 now to get this quotation that Paul is referring to. Hang on, I'm busy talking and not turning. Let me catch up with you. What's happened here is that God has called him out and promised that his descendants would be like the stars in the heavens. That's verse 5. He brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to me, to him, so shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. So Abraham was counted as righteous. To be counted as righteous, or this is accredited to him as righteousness, when he believed. Now, Galatians and Romans follow a similar argumentation. In Romans, he points out, he doesn't mention it here, but this was before he was circumcised. In fact, if you want to look, it's chapter 17 of Genesis when circumcision is introduced. So the... Abraham believing God's promise, that faith being counted to him as righteousness, happened chronologically before he was circumcised. So it, it kind of, you know, comes ahead of that. And he's going he's to make a similar kind of argument here when it comes to the law and the promise. So back in Galatians 3, back in Galatians 3, he builds on this in verse 7. Know then it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel before to Abraham, saying, In you shall all nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Okay, back to Genesis chapter 12 this time. This is really where it all begins. Genesis 12 is the call of Abraham and the promises made to Abraham. The original promises made to Abraham are here in chapter 12. Beginning of verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, this is even before he's called Abraham, he's just Abram now, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and in him who dishonors you, I, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. Paul says there's the gospel right there. Paul said the gospel was preached to Abraham by God in Genesis 12. And the gospel in Genesis 12, verse 3, includes salvation for Gentiles through faith, which is his whole gospel. 
And he said, look, that was in Genesis 12, 3. How does he see that there? He says it's there because he says, in you shall all families of the earth, not just the Israelites. said, this is what they missed out on. This is the part they stumbled over and got mixed up on. They felt like you could only be blessed if you were part of the family of Israel. But he says here, actually, the promise, the original promise to Abraham included all the families of the earth. Somehow that little detail, they never grasped the significance of that. The Jews, they got, and you can understand why when you read the rest of the Old Testament, they felt like we're God's chosen people and it's really all about us. And they, but they misunderstood the fact that from the beginning, that wasn't the original plan. The original plan was for all the nations to be blessed, not just one. And so he's saying, there's the gospel right there. And, and that we who are of faith, our descendants and heirs of this promise, we share in that promise by being like Abraham, our father, in a sense that we have faith like he had faith, and we are blessed like he was blessed. So back to our text in Galatians. Notice it says in verse 8, as we just read, seeing that God would justify. Now, if you have the ESV, as I'm reading from, you have a little footnote that says that justify basically means to be declared righteous. And notice how that connects with the previous verse in verse 6. It was counted to him as righteousness. What was counted to him as righteousness? He believed God. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. And now he's saying it was that gospel that by faith you can be justified or made righteous was preached in Genesis 12, 3 to Abraham. I thought maybe that was my alarm. Well, Grant and I have the same uh, alarm sound. Okay. I was about to have to run down there and find my phone. So, back to our um, text. Genesis, uh, let's see. Back to Galatians, and we got down to verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to, and do them. Okay, that's Deuteronomy 27. Let's turn back over there and see where he's referring to. How is the law? How did the law bring curses? Well, it's actually spelled out in the law. It's specifically listed here in the law. In Deuteronomy 27, notice how the chapter begins. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people, saying, keep the whole commandment that I command you today. That's the beginning of all of it. But notice what happens. We get down to um, verse 9. They, 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 they pronounce curses and blessings. Moses and the Levitical priests said to Israel, keep silence and hear, O Israel, this day you become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. And then begins a long series of curses. Verse 15, cursed be the man who makes a mark, uh, image. Curse, 16, cursed be anyone who dishonors his father and mother. And just watch how every one of those verses begins with curse, 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 curse. All the way down to the last verse, verse 28, cursed be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them. And the people said, amen. They agreed to this. They had no choice, really. But the, the law... Gave them a list of rules. They had counted them up. I can't remember. It's like hundreds of them. And there was all these rules. You, you must do this. You must not do that. And if you, don't, if you don't keep the law, you are cursed. And they said, yes, we agree. And what Paul says is the law basically brought the people under a curse because nobody kept it. Everybody failed in some way. Everybody sinned. Everybody violated one or another or lots of those commandments. And so what the law did was it showed them the standard of righteousness of what God requires. And, and it brought with it the condemnation of breaking it. And so the law just basically held up this standard. And what it did, it didn't save the people. It actually imprisoned them under the curse of the fact they had broken it. So let's go back to Galatians 3 and see how he reasons through this. So again, in verse 10, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Well, now we know why. 
For it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it's evident that no one is justified by God by the law. For the righteous shall live by faith. That's a quotation from Habakkuk. But it just, it just shows again that this gospel of salvation and being justified by faith it's not some newfangled thing that Paul made up. He says, you can see it in Genesis 12, 3. You can, I'm quoting from a prophet here, Habakkuk, who also said the same thing, that you can righteousness is by faith. And he says, the law is not of faith. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. Verse 12. So the, the law showed them what to do, but it, didn't, uh, it wasn't something that was by faith. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. A very interesting argument. So the people were, the law, what it essentially did was lock everybody down under a curse because they had broken it. And in order to break the curse, in order to have the curse removed, Jesus came and became cursed himself. Now, the way everybody else was cursed was because they broke the law. Jesus was cursed in a different way. He didn't ever break any of the laws. He was the only one who didn't. But he became cursed by being crucified, and there was a curse associated with that. So he took on a curse himself. The Son of God became cursed for the sake of his people who were cursed so that the curse of the law could be removed and that people could now be justified by faith. And that's, that's what Paul is arguing. So that, verse 14, in Christ Jesus, in him, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. So this promised spirit, you can go back to Isaiah 32 and Isaiah 44 and then Joel 2 and several places where it says, in those days I'll pour out my spirit on your descendants. There was a promise that the spirit would be poured out. And Paul says, this is part of the promise that goes all the way back to Genesis 12. And that promise is available to the Gentiles, not by becoming Jews and taking on the curse of the law, but instead, by faith in Jesus Christ, they can inherit the promises that were made to Abraham and to his descendants because we, by faith, become the true children of Abraham. So then he asks the question, you might be wondering this yourself. Okay, well, if that's all the case, then why did God give him a law? Why the law? He asks it in verse 19. He, it, Paul's good at kind of reading our minds. You might be wondering if this is the case, why did we need the law at all? He says, well, it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise has been made. It was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now, an intermediary implies more than one that God is one. A couple of difficult things about this paragraph. One is, what does he mean by it was added because of transgressions? And two, what does this statement about an intermediary mean? Uh, the best explanation I could find on that intermediary one, to take the second part first, is um, an intermediary almost, almost depicts a negotiation between two parties. Like, like, let's say we're, kind of, we're trying to work out some details and there's a, he comes and talks to me and I said, well, I really want this. And he goes and talks to you. Oh, I want this. He kind of works it out. That may be what he means by it implies two parties. But in fact, God is the only party. There's no intermediary that's kind of negotiating this between God and his people. So that, that's probably what that... He's probably saying there's a limitation to the metaphor the, the, of, the, of an intermediary. Now, but back to verse 21... I'm sorry, verse 19, to be added because of transgressions is also kind of hard to understand, I think, but it sounds to me like you had the people of God. Think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and his descendants. And it's like a car with the, uh, with the alignments off. And so it's constantly trying to pull into the ditch. And the people were like always going astray, going astray, going astray. And so the plan was that a descendant would come through whom all nations would be blessed. And the law was given in the meantime to try to fence in the people in a sense, to try to steer them in the right way, to keep them from going uh, astray. I, I imagine it like either training wheels on a bicycle or if you've ever gone bowling, you know, there's some bowling alley that have the option to put up little guards to keep your ball out of the gutter. And so you put these guards up and then the ball just kind of bounces off the guards till it makes its way down. And uh, that's sort of like what the law is. I'm imagining what he's saying here. It was put in place and it is a temporary measure to kind of keep things going the way they're supposed to go. But it was not the thing. It was not really the ultimate goal or the ultimate. Um, it did not bring the kind of life 
Because notice what he says in verse 21. Is the law contrary to the purposes of God or promises of God? Certainly not. If a law had been given that could give life, then righteousness would indeed be by the law. Like that, if it could have served that purpose, then that would have been fine, but it didn't. The scriptures instead imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be to those who believe. So again, the purpose, listing all these laws kind of like put up those bumper guards so that now the people would, it would hopefully kind of keep them more or less aimed in the right way. But that itself did not give them life, the kind of life that we have through faith in Jesus. Verse 23, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. This word guardian here, um, from what I've read, there's really not an English parallel to it. We don't have a concept in our society or our language that's exactly the same. The, um, the original word is where we get our word pedagogue, which has a lot to do with, um, uh, we think of pedagogue as a, uh, a teacher, and it's, a, it's used in an educational setting. It has a whole meaning about the way you teach. But uh, let me read this little description of this person in the original context. It was a man, usually a slave, whose duty it was to conduct a boy or youth to and from school and to superintend his general conduct. He was not a teacher. When the young man became of age, the pedagogue was no longer needed. So if you were a um, prominent family, let's say you have uh, household slaves or servants and you've got a child and he's going to be the heir one day. He's going to like take over the family business. He's going to be the one who's going to, you know, carry on your name and he's going to be your you know your heir but he's just a boy he's just a kid and he might get himself into trouble he might fall under the influence of the wrong people he might get himself into danger so you would assign a servant or a slave to kind of chaperone him and accompany him to make sure he didn't wander off and get into trouble and this chaperone would accompany the boy to and from school and from what I've read, they might even sit down with them at the end of the day and kind of go over their lessons and make sure they're staying on track of their homework and all that. But the purpose of this guardian was like a chaperone. When you send your kids on a school trip and they have certain adults that go and they just try to make sure that their kids don't wander off and get lost or get into trouble. Um, they're not the teachers, but they're just there to kind of watch over. And that's really the, um, the role of this pedagogue, from what I understand, in the original. So Paul says that's sort of how the law functions. You had these children who were supposed to be the heirs who had to grow up and become the sons. And so in the meantime, between now and then, uh, a guardian was given to them, someone to kind of, you know, try to keep them out of trouble. And that guardian is sort of how the law functioned in, during its time. But the day comes when the child is grown and the servant quits following him around because now he's a son in every right and he doesn't need a, uh, somebody following him around to keep him out of trouble. So that role of the pedagogue, of the guardian, was a limited role. It didn't last throughout their lifetime. It only lasted until they got big enough to be, you know, on their own. And so that's what he's saying here about the law. It served a temporary function, and then it was taken away. He says in verse 25, now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian. We don't need that anymore. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. There's the other thing that, that includes the Gentiles as well. You are also sons, not just the Jews. And then he sends this home in verse 27 and following. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female. You're all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So, Everyone, and this is what Paul had come, remember? He came to town, he taught Jesus, he publicly portrayed him as crucified. He told them this story. Some rejected it, some stumbled over it, some laughed at it, some scoffed at it, some believed. The ones who believed and responded by faith were baptized. Right? They became Christians. There was no circumcision. There was no, now you got to, you know, start being, keeping the law and all that. They had responded by faith 
to the offspring, the true son that had been promised back in Genesis 12, they had responded to God's plan by faith, and that's what God has always wanted. And now they were Christians, sons of God, heirs of the promises, on equal footing with anybody else, including those who had grown up as Jews, because now through this washing of baptism into Christ, all those former distinctions cease to matter. How you grew up, what you believe, where you came from, what language you spoke, even if you're a man or a woman. In some ways, by becoming Christians, you just become part of the body of Christ and, and everybody is equal here. Now, we know we have to look at other passages to see that there's, you know, within the body that he had roles and he had, you know, and Lee's got a whole class he's working on that we're going to study after uh, the class that we're doing in the next hour when we finish that, uh, that book on kind of the roles in the church. But when it comes to our status as children of God, everybody, there is no distinction in Christ, everybody is a son of God and everybody is an heir to the faith through faith in Jesus, not because of keeping of the law, specifically the law of Moses. So a couple of conclusions. The, now that we are Christians, sons of God by faith, there's no need to be put under the guardianship of the law. So there's no need to kind of impose that, hey, you need a guardian. No, no, we, that's, that, that, law, that function of the law had finished its uh, role. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, but I think that's something that maybe needs to be, we probably need to hear that every now and then. There's not black Christians and white Christians and American Christians and European Christians or African Christians. Um, there's just Christians. If you're in the body of Christ, all those things that the world sees as dividing people into categories, those categories don't apply within the body of Christ. And we need to know that. And we need to understand that that uh, Christians in, uh, in other countries, Christians that, that look different than us, Christians that speak different languages, Christians that you know don't speak English, all, they're just Christians. They're, they're, they're heirs of that same promise that we're heirs to. And we have that promise by faith in God. And that's the fundamental thing. And we'll, we'll keep emphasizing that. It is the faith that is the, at the heart of it all. And that is, that is absolutely emphasized by Paul. Some people say, well, okay, if that's the case, then that rules out any obedience or even any even baptism. This is, a, this is where this comes like a tricky point for some people. Okay, if we're saved by faith, then, then baptism has no place. But look, even in this passage where he just spent the whole chapter saying that it's by faith, he still concludes in verse 27, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So faith doesn't exclude baptism. Baptism is also a response of faith. Baptism is, is a response of faith to the message of the gospel. Just like the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. He preached to him Jesus, and as soon as he heard the story, he said, there's some water, why can't I get in it? Because that was part of the story of the gospel. If you tell somebody the story of Jesus and you tell the whole thing and they believe, they're going to want to know, where's the water and how can I get in it? That's going to be the response of faith to this. So that doesn't rule out baptism. It actually includes baptism, as we see here in this very passage. Finally, living by faith is different than living by law. And that's the other thing that I think is, is going to be important to try to wrap our minds around as we go through this study of Galatians um, and we'll have to just save the developing of that for future lessons. That's especially we get into um, Galatians 5. I think that'll be helpful. So keep that in mind, and we'll be, we'll be studying that together and trying to, to understand and grow in that way together. But first, we want to offer the opportunity for anyone who might be here who's never responded by faith to this message. If you've seen Jesus publicly portrayed as crucified, and you believe that he's your Savior, you believe he's the Son of God, and you want to be an heir of those promises, it starts with saying, I believe, and where's the water? And we have the water, and if you want to respond to that, we would be thrilled that, to have that this very hour. And if we can help you, let us know as we stand and sing. Praise.